introduce uh, Manos Berlakis, uh, Professor Berlakis, uh, who uh, is at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. And, and I, I want to commend you, too, on the awesome meeting. This has been great. But uh, you're going to be talking with us about the five most anticipated interventional trials for the year ahead. Welcome, Manos. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bain. And again, thank you all. And, and thanks for a great panel. I had the great opportunity last night to learn this topic. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud couldn't make it, so at 1 a.m. I had the opportunity to look at the most anticipated uh, interventional trials. So I might be a little confounded because I had several glasses of iced tea. So you know, you might have the judgment it might not be the best. So, but how do you talk about the anticipated trials and how do you find what's going on? And that's word of mouth. So I asked a few people, but you know, at 1 a.m. it's hard to get really informed opinions. The other way to do this is to go on clinicaltrials.gov and actually uh, scroll at studies that are ongoing or f uh, finishing up right now. And actually, if you've got coronary interventions, there's about 147 studies. So I had a lot of learning last night. And this is what I found and what I think is going to be the most uh, anticipated trial for the next year. Um, this is um, on the culprit shock. Remember, culprit shock was published at DC, presented at DCT last year, published in New England. It shows that if you have a cardiogenic shock, Essentially, we should only fix the culprit lesion because if you do immediate multivessel PCI, you're going to have more death and more renal failure. But the question comes, what's, what should we do in people who have ACS but do not have cardiogenic shock? And the study called COMPLETE it should be finished in the next year. And this is a 4,000 patient study that takes people with STEMI who undergo successful primary PCI, and then within uh, 70, uh, 72 hours, the uh, randomized to either get complete revascularization or treat them with medical therapy alone, follow up for a mean of four years, and then the primary endpoint is a clinical endpoint of death MI with a primary endpoint of death uh, MI and uh, uh, ischemia-driven revascularization. So this study is going to tell us whether the culprit shock applies to uh, people who have a STEMI but are successfully treated and are hemodynamically stable, doing well within three days their primary PCI. So this is coming up soon. Number two. This actually I put in because in the shock session yesterday, we had an excellent presentation from Naveen Kapoor, and people were just um, um, super excited about this. Now, this may or may not pan out, but for those of you who were in the shock session, there was a debate between Hari Naidu and uh, Naveen Kapoor about whether the door to balloon is obsolete and now we should be replaced by the door to unloading, meaning that you come for a STEMI, forget the culprit artery, what you should do is put them on uh, some, th some way to unload their ventricle, instead of decreasing, in increasing the myocardial supply, decrease their demand, and maybe that's better because you might reduce the damage and as a result the long-term problems with large area of myocardial infarction and the need for uh, um, ventricular support therapies, VADs, and other problems. And there is actually a lot of work that uh, uh, Naveen has done showing that with unloading in animal models, you do have actually better protection and less myocardium dying. So this study is a fascinating study. The enrollment is completed. It's 50 patients who have anterior STEMI, and they're um, randomized I mean, uh, to either get a all of them get unloading immediately. So they go to the lab and they get an impeller device. And then one group, you wait for 30 minutes and then two primary PCI. And in the other group, you uh, do immediately the PCI the same way we would do right now. Um, of course, Naveen was describing his experience early on, which is obviously very stressful. We never used to be in the cath lab with the STEMI pace and then waiting for 30 minutes to open the artery. I mean, that's a pretty stressful experience, as you can imagine. But uh, the study is completed. Uh, probably won't be ready for TCT by Miami American Heart. So although it's a small study, nothing like the other American trials, I think mechanistically is very interesting to me because it completely changes the paradigm of how we're going to treat STEMI in the cath lab. Number three. You know, some of the challenges that we have in um, PCI have to do with um, severe calcification. And I'll actually show you some of the products I think are going to be popular in the next year. But calcification is bad because you cannot assess the lesion very well, hard to get stents there, and also hard to expand the stents, so you have higher risk for stenosis and stent thrombosis as well. And the largest study done to date on this is the Rotaxus trial. It's been now several years that this was been done. It was only 240 patients. So we're treating essentially a very large subgroup of lesions with a study with 240 patients that didn't show any significant benefit with rotational atherectomy, but did show that you have more stent loss if you don't do atherectomy up front. So the next study that's coming, it may not be ready until late, ne even late next year or the year after, but it's the Eclipse trial that we may have seen, which is the largest study ever done in severely calcified lesions. 2,000 patients randomized one-to-one -to, -one to orbital atherectomy versus angioplasty. 
with the primary point being a clinical endpoint of uh, target vessel failure. So this study will give us much more information. Should we be doing upfront atherectomy? What are the benefits, risks? What is the crossover age? So highly anticipated study. I think it's about a quarter enrolled, but enrollment is really accelerating right now. Number four. This actually was going to be presented at European Heart in about um, uh, a month from now. And this is a very large trial called the Leaders Free Trial. Um, I'm sorry, it was the, it's the, it's the Global Leaders presented, but builds on the stand that was used in the Leaders Free Trial. That study was presented a couple of years ago, ago at TCT, and that's the one study that showed that if you use a, a drug eluting versus bare metal stand in high risk for bleeding patients, and you give everyone only one month of DAPT, most people were using bare metal because saying, well, bare metal is going to be safer. It was actually the exact opposite. The drug eluting stent had significantly lower incidence of cardiac death, MI, and stent thrombosis. And um, as a result, of changing the way we think about how to approach these uh, high-risk bleeding patients. And actually, that created much less incentive for using bare metal stents. So I'm biased about this, but I think vein graft is the only area where you can put bare metal stents. Maybe we can debate this later on. So the Global Leader Study is going to be presented um, next month. It's a 16,000 patient study that essentially is looking at the impact of aspirin. So aspirin has been, of course, a class one indication for many years. It's cheap. It's effective in the early studies. But now we do have some better antiplatelet agents. And the question this is trying to answer is that if we um, drop the aspirin early on, so the one arm, you get ticagrelor for 24 months and aspirin for just one month, and then stop aspirin beyond ticagrelor. In the other arm, you do your standard 12 months of DAPT with um, aspirin and ticagrelor clopidogrel, and then you continue with only aspirin afterwards. And the primary endpoint is the two-year composite all of all-cause mortality and non-QF myocardial infarction. So massive study completely changes the paradigm in terms of antiplatelet therapy for patients who um, have ACS or acute or uh, stable angina, and we're very excited to see how that goes. And number five, which actually is very similar to this study, also has to do with aspirin, dropping it early on, but this is a different flavor. This is Roxana Meran's study, that the Twilight trial, which what it's doing is, is using ticagrelor for three months together with aspirin, but then one arm, you drop the aspirin. In the other arm, you continue um, dual antiplatelet therapy for the first year. This is about a year out, but also will try make us understand which way is better. Do we really need aspirin, or is it time to get rid of aspirin? Now, there are many questions, bleeding, cost, that have to be sorted out. But in terms of science, these are some of the exciting studies going ahead. There are many other things going on. Probably will be in a longer time frame the next year. You know, FAME3 is going on. The ischemia trial. There's the hybrid trial. Um, there's another study of radial versus femoral for STEMI. But these are going to be at a longer time horizon. But I'll also take a few minutes about the three products I think are going to be the most anticipated for the next year. The first one in my mind is having a good cover stand. The one worst thing you have is a perforation, and nothing is going to go down. As you know, in the United States, we only have the graft master right now, which is better than nothing. But to deliver it in calcified lesions, it's very difficult. Well, the good news are, I mean, hopefully in the next year, we're going to have the papyrus, which is a single stand with a um, uh, PTFE membrane versus two stands, much more deliverable. As speaking to Europeans and Canadians, it's a great, much better stand. So I'm the most excited about this device for next year. The next one has to do with uh, lithoplasty. Calcified lesions remain a problem. This device, there's a disrupt CAD study that um, uh, actually will be published in circulation soon, showing that you can treat 50 people with very high success rates and very low complication and very, very easy. You put a balloon, press a button, and that can dilate very calcified lesions. So we're looking forward to this. And the third one, which is actually imminent, is going to be available uh, in the next few months, is the Sion Black. This is a polymer jacketed wire, and for CT operators, one of the ta tasks that, that are hard is getting through septal collaterals or very tortuous collaterals. And this wire is what is used in Europe routinely and has the best characteristics, replaces Fielder FC, replaces Whisper uh, with a composite core technology. So to summarize, the five studies I think are going to uh, be the most anticipated have to do with management of uh, ACS, the complete trial in terms of what to stand, the door to unloading. Uh, for complex lesions, calcified lesion eclipse, and then uh, for pharmacotherapy, the study is looking at ticagrelor alone versus aspirin and see how that pans out. So thank you very much.
Uh, Mono's great list, uh, great list for creation at one o'clock in the morning too. Uh, it's amazing. Um, you know, uh, I'm really excited about the uh, Naveen's door to unloading trial, but I do think somewhere within us as interventional cardiologists, we do know that door to balloon times really don't apply to people in cardiogenic shock. I mean, the difference between a door to balloon time of 95 minutes and 85 minutes when someone's been sitting around at home for four hours already to begin with and then is in shock, somehow I really uh, agree that it doesn't make any sense. But that is separate from the question of whether unloading itself is the answer. But, uh, but these are not shock, these are people without shock. These are people with yeah. standard anterior yeah. mind. Yeah. And instead of opening the artery, which would tip, you just put them on unloading first. So yeah. it's a little different question, but I agree with you. It's, uh, uh, many people have concerns in terms of visibility, bleeding, large seat bores in people that we you know, have a, a lot of 2B3A sometimes and intensive endoplasmic yeah. therapy. Yeah. And one other trial I might offer for our consideration is complete, uh, looking at whether complete revascularization in the <coughs> STEMI population is, is the right thing to do or not. Okay. But that's the number one. Yeah. Oh, wait, did I not hear? <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Sorry. I wasn't no, listening. Perfect. <laughs> so just a couple comments to follow up. I, I guess that's my concern about the D2 unloading trial is that, um, and we'll talk about it in innovations in STEMI coming up, is, is it too, uh, will it be sick enough population that you actually can test what you're trying to test? So that's my concern about that. I, I think Eclipse is a really important trial. And for those of you that are participating out there, what I would really encourage is enroll everybody. Enroll in this trial because we really need to know the answer to this uh, study. Um, and you know, where we are, we know calcium is important, but we do not have a trial that shows that making a difference uh, with um, any, with rotoblader or any other device now makes it, and this trial is critically important. But it's not just enroll, it's enroll everybody, you say. Enroll everybody. Because if enroll, you enroll the ones where you, you think there's equipoise, exactly. it's a bias toward to That's enroll. critically important if you don't enroll consistently all your patients with calcium. So I think that's a really important thing. Thing. And then I think Twilight is really a unique trial that will maybe really change it. It's enrolled well around the world, and I, I think I'm really uh, looking forward to those results. So it's an excellent list, and I'm also very impressed at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> now, I just want to know what type of iced tea it was, whether it's the New York variant or whether it's the... Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank All you right, very much. Thanks,